welcome to all. Uh, I need to be on here. Welcome to all of, of you who are here, uh, all those who are watching online. So glad that we could all be together, uh, either in body or in spirit, so that we can worship God together, so that we can study His Word together, and so that moving forward, we can continually uh, love one another and reach the lost. It's that fourth part of the spiritual growth cycle, reaching the lost, that I would like to focus on in today's lesson as we all strive to grow to, to God's glory. This is a very, very important part of the spiritual growth process and probably one of the hardest, if not the hardest for, for many uh, of us. So we're going to talk today about our responsibility in evangelism. I believe there's a bit of a problem with our understanding of evangelism. And as a result of our misconception, a lot of people carry around unnecessary guilt. And some others do absolutely no evangelism because of our misunderstanding. So I'm going to help us to help to clarify what evangelism is and what our responsibility and what our role is really in evangelism as we go forward through through the lesson. But I want to start in Ezekiel 33. Brian taught about this in the auditorium class today. In verses 7 through 9, the Lord said to Ezekiel, Now as for you, son of man, I have appointed you a watchman for the house of Israel. So you will hear a message from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from your hand. But if you on your part warn a wicked man to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he will die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your life. Can I be really honest with y'all? <laughs> I'm really glad I'm not Ezekiel. Not just because he lived 2,600 years ago before things like air conditioning. <laughs> but, you know, I am glad I did not receive that specific charge from the Lord. To, hey, make sure you warn everybody around you. And if you fail to do that, and they don't serve me, uh, and they suffer the punishment for that, well, their blood's going to be on your head. <coughs> what a huge responsibility that would be. What a terrifying responsibility that would be. However, even though I'm not Ezekiel and you're not Ezekiel, that doesn't mean that we bear no responsibility in turning the lost to God and in reaching out to, to lost souls. What is the commission that was given to Christians in general? Well, I think it is best summed up in the Sermon on the Mount when the Lord said, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So yes, we do have an evangelistic charge to let our light shine and not to hide that light, as the previous couple of verses say in, in Matthew 5 there. So we're going to kind of examine that. And here's the, here's the takeaway. Here's the takeaway that we're going to get for today. We all have a role in saving lost souls. We all have a role in saving lost souls. So we're going to unpack that idea, but first we need to make sure we understand what evangelism is. We're going to talk about the definition of it. The word evangelism is not in our English versions. There may be some versions that have it, but it's not in the New American Standard or New King James or some you know the, the real standard versions that are out there. But the Greek word is in the New Testament. And it doesn't matter if you remember this, but it's euangelizo. That's where we get the English word evangelism. So you can kind of hear a little bit of similarity in the way it's pronounced, euangelizo. That word means bring good news. It's interesting, the, the word angel is in that, that word. Did you realize the word angel is in evangelism? An angel is a messenger, one who brings a message. So there's that inherent idea in evangelism is bringing a message, and it's good news. It's the good news of the gospel, okay? The, a passage that demonstrates this probably better than any other passage is Romans 10, 15. In this context, 
Paul is talking about you know, belief and that, the role of belief in our salvation and how can we believe if we haven't heard the word and how can we hear unless someone preaches to us. And then he says this, how will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. How beautiful are your feet today? We're not talking about physical feet. We're talking about your evangelistic feet. The idea of carrying a message, using your feet to carry and deliver a message. How beautiful are those feet that work hard at delivering uh, a message on God's behalf. So there you see the word uh, uh, that, is, that is translated, bring good news. That is the word we get evangelism from. How beautiful are the feet of those who evangelize good things. That could be another way of translating that. Now, in this context in Romans 10 and another context where we have the idea of evangelism, the idea is teaching, teaching the gospel to the lost. That is the primary idea of evangelism. We have teachers here. We have men who get up publicly and talk we have men and women who teach Bible classes. We have those of you who teach in private settings. And in as much as you have lost people in your audience, you are doing technically the work of evangelism. You are actually teaching the gospel to the lost in those situations. There may be some here that teach the gospel to the lost without even realizing it. I, years ago, in, in, uh, I think it was when I still lived in Athens, Alabama, uh, and any time I talk about Alabama, I all of a sudden get a really southern twang. So you all have to forgive me about that. But so I was, I was at a, like a 4th of July celebration with, uh, with some brethren. And I was talking to another guy about my age, and he had a baby. And um, so he, his wife had the baby. But he, he, has this, he and his wife had this new, new child in their, in their life. And he was just expressing to me this kind of guilt that he feels that he's, he's not really doing anything for the Lord right now because he's so busy being a father and all the things that that entails and restless nights and all that, even though that mostly falls on the wife, that it does fall on the husband too. And he told me that he had a conversation with a preacher where he told the preacher he feels like he's just not using his talents because of this child and how busy he is. And the preacher very wisely said to him, at this point in your life, that baby is your talent. And I thought, what, what a comforting word. And I just want to say to all of us young parents in here, all of you young parents who maybe got even babies, and we've got a lot of new babies, it's, it's hard. And maybe you're not out evangelizing the world, but if you are focusing on your child and your children... If you're raising your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, if you are teaching them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up, like Deuteronomy 6 says, that is the work of evangelism. There are preachers who try to convert the world and neglect their own family. That's the foremost responsibility you have as far as evangelism is concerned is those precious souls that are in your own house. So... I want to comfort you in that way. Maybe you're doing evangelism and you don't even, even realize it. And here's another comforting thing. Though evangelism is technically teaching the gospel to the lost, the work of evangelism is facilitated by actions other than teaching. Some of y'all remember Light On. That's his name. It's the most confusing name ever. Uh, his name is Light On. And he's from Nigeria, and when he's in the area, he will come and visit with us regularly. You ever notice how many people he brings with him? He doesn't even live here all the time. But he just he invites people, and he gets people to come here. That's a talent. And we have others here who are good at that as well. If you're good at inviting people, but maybe you, you're not really that great of a teacher, yet still... Even just that work of inviting people, you are facilitating evangelism. You're taking part in the work of evangelism in that way because you're leading them to people who can teach them. You're leading them here where they're going to be taught when they're here. That's a very, very important work. There are other, other ways of facilitating 
evangelism. And Peter talks about one of these in 1 Peter 3, where he says, Wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. If you, you know, if there's a woman that's got a husband that's a non-Christian, according to this passage, she can convert that man without a word. Now, at some point, a word has to be spoken. God's word has to be taught to him so that he really knows what to do. But the point is, she, she is facilitating the work of evangelism by her example. He observes this person with these wonderful Christian virtues acting as, in such a beautiful way, and it draws him to the gospel. She is facilitating that by her example, by her life. So, again, just by the way we live, we can be facilitating evangelism. And that's the most powerful sermon you're ever going to preach is your life anyway. So let's not forget that. So, I'm, I mean, what I'm so concerned about is too often sermons on evangelism are just bashing us all over the head because, hey, you guys are not all teaching the gospel. Shame on you, not teaching, 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 teaching. And you just end up feeling a whole bunch of shame. So there's more to it than teaching. You see? That's what I'm trying to get at. We all have a role in saving lost souls. I want you to really be thinking about what is your role. It's one of your discussion questions. We're going to talk about it in a small group. What is your role, your talent? as far as either doing evangelism or facilitating the work. All of us do need to be involved in one of those two. So we'll talk more about that. But someone may ask, well, is evangelism an individual responsibility? I mean, is it something we all have to do? And my answer to that is yes, but the, the answer I give here is multifaceted. First of all, not all Christians must be teachers. Now, it'd be easy for me to get up here and quote what Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And to shame all of you because we're not doing that. But you know what? Jesus didn't say that to us individually. Who did he say that to in Matthew 28? He said that to his apostles, the ones who were sent out. It was their job to take the gospel to the whole world. If he said that to us, we are failing miserably in carrying that out. And we need to be terrified on the day of judgment. He didn't say that to us. He said that to his apostles. And listen to what James said. He wrote, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. That's the first verse of chapter 3 of James. You know what chapter 3 of James is all about, right? It's all about the tongue. The sins of the tongue. The tongue is a fire of the very world of iniquity, of iniquity. I'm talking too fast. And that whole chapter starts out, let not many be teachers. And I think the point in the context is when you teach God's Word, whether you're in the Bible classes or whether it's to your children or whether you're, you're doing it publicly in some way like I'm doing right now, you have to be careful what you say because it's God's Word. And you have to be careful how you say it. And so, therefore, James says, let not many of you be teachers. Those of us who are teachers, we will incur a stricter judgment. And I realize that. It's a big responsibility. Big responsibility. Now, that's not to discourage people from becoming teachers who have that in them. But let's be honest. Some people don't have it in them. Some people just don't have it in them to be an effective teacher. And they don't maybe have the control of their tongue to really be a teacher. So it's okay. Just invite. Okay? Just encourage. Just do your part. But let me say this. There are many who should be teachers who are not and who are just being lazy. Let's be honest. I mean, the writer of Hebrews had to give a rebuke in Hebrews chapter 5. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, 
you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. Shame on you, the writer says, and I say to you, if you should be a teacher, if you have that ability, if you should be further along in your knowledge than you are now, shame on you. And you need to change. You need to work to change that. And listen to this verse in Acts 8. This is, I love this verse. This is after the stoning of Stephen and the persecution that followed that, and then the, the Christians were scattered. It says, therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Well, who was preaching? Was that the apostles in that verse? No, these were just normal Christians. These were just disciples. Preachers are not the only ones who preach. Others can also do the work of preaching who are not filling the role of preacher, you see. And so we, need, we do need more people on the forefront, uh, 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 on the front lines who are out there and actually technically doing evangelism, teaching the gospel to, to the lost. There, there are so many more that we need. The church needs more laborers. Whether you are on the front lines or whether you are facilitating the work, we need more people laboring in this work of, of evangelism. Jesus, in Luke 10, when he was sending out the 70 disciples on a limited commission, he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Hey, brethren, the harvest is plentiful here in Altamont Springs. The harvest is not the problem. The problem is there's not enough laborers. That's the problem. We need more laborers. We need more feet on the ground. We need more of those beautiful feet that are taking the message to the lost. Jesus in Matthew 4, when he was passing by the Sea of Galilee, he saw these two fishermen out there. One of them was named Peter. The other one was his brother named Andrew, and they were casting their nets. And he's on the shore, and he says, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. I wonder what they thought that meant. And again, he didn't say that to us individually. I don't think God has given each one of us the individual charge. You're a fisher of men, you're a fisher of men, you're a fisher of men. But as a whole, that's what God wants for the church to be doing. We want to be about the, the work of saving the lost. Anybody in here like fishing? Okay, got a couple anyway. I do not like fishing, I'm sorry to say. But if you like fishing, let's say that you, you felt like, I'm going to go fishing today, but I'm not going to take any of my fishing equipment. It's just me and the boat. And you get out there in the middle of the body of water, and you wait for the fish to jump in your boat. How good of a fisherman are you going to be? You're not going to catch anything. I mean, that would be like the equivalent maybe of somebody walking up to you on the street, a perfect stranger who says, uh, Mr. or Mrs., I know I've never met you, but I just feel like you could teach me how to go to heaven. I'm lost. And I need you to teach me the conditions for salvation and tell me where to go to church and tell me the address and tell me what time it starts. Can you do that for me, please? That'd be a fish just jumping in your boat. Has that ever happened to anybody? Probably not. I know when I say that, I realize probably somebody's going to come up to me afterwards and say, I had a fish jump in my boat. And somebody else is going to say, I had a stranger tell me they need to learn, learn the gospel. It can happen. But that's not a good strategy, is it? That's not a good strategy. We have to fish. You have to... Take the time and go to the effort and get your boat out there and get a sunburn. You have to fish if you want to catch the fish. Same thing is true evangelistically. We have to fish in the sea of the lost to try to rescue those souls by the grace of God and pull them to salvation. Now, I'll tell you something else that I think it was Paul Harvey that said this years ago. He said, we have left off being fishers of men and have become keepers of the aquarium. Oh, we want to make sure the saved stay saved. And we put all our, of our emphasis on teaching those who are already saved. And we want to make sure we have good song leading. And we want to make sure that we have a nice clean church building. And we keep this aquarium clean. And the fish in here are well fed. But if we're not fishing for more fish out here to put in the aquarium, guess what's going to happen to this nice, beautiful aquarium of ours? It's going to be empty. 
it's going to be empty. So we have to go fishing. We have to remember our role of evangelism as a whole, as the Lord's people, to be about that mission. And I do believe that every Christian should share the work of evangelism in some way. Now, I gave a couple of examples earlier about some other ways to be involved in the work of evangelism than actually teaching. Uh, what, what other examples might there be? Well, I know that there are some ladies here who do now, it, it, at least I know they used to, uh, send out bulletins to people that they know. And that's evangelism. It may be that your talent is writing cards and writing letters. So you can send those to people you know and love, people you're concerned about. You can put spiritual thoughts in there and Bible verses in there. That is evangelism. You are, you are participating in that work. It may be that, if nothing else, you're just a really good encourager. And you know how to welcome people who are visiting from the community, who are looking for truth, and you just make them feel like they're part of a family and make them feel like they're home. We need all of that. So every Christian should share in the work in some way. We all have a role in saving lost souls. But let's focus now on this last part of my lesson on that saving lost souls bit. How do we carry out that mission? I want to give you three suggestions. The first one is by everyone doing their part. And I've already been talking about that, so I don't have to elaborate on that. But the church is a body, and it's described as a body for a reason. And uh, that's because we need all the parts of the body working together in unison. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul uh, is talking about Jesus at the end of verse 15. And then he says in verse 16, "...from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love." We need each part, everyone, in, in terms of evangelism, we need everybody using their talent, their specific role, and, and all of that working together, you know what? If you bring me somebody, I can teach them. I'm not that great at finding them. I'll be honest with you. I, I'm kind of I'm passive in my personality. I'm not actually super outgoing uh, in real life. <laughs> I am up here in the pulpit. And I need you guys to help bring me people. Give me, I'll teach them. I love that. And I want to get better at the other things I'm not good at. But we need all of us working together in order to make this all make this all happen. Second suggestion, by teachers teaching others to teach. Teachers teaching others to teach. That's just a little fun to say. But in 2 Timothy, Paul told Timothy, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Going back to the fishing metaphor from earlier, I said I don't really like to fish. It's not really my, my thing. And part of the reason is my dad never taught me how to fish, which I'm not complaining about. He taught me plenty of other things. That's just not one thing. He knows how to fish. He was good at it. He loves it. But he never really gave me that skill set. And maybe it's because I didn't really want to. I don't know. But I, I, I never really learned how. And he, of course, never taught me how to teach anybody how to fish. So when it comes to my kids... My boys don't really know how to fish. We had a little spell where I tried to kind of teach them how to fish, and uh, they learned a little bit. It was kind of a disaster most of the time. There was one time where one of my boys was trying to cast a line, and the hook went into the side of uh, Holly's father's cheek. <laughs> so, you know, fishing with my family could be quite an excursion. I, I say all that to say this. Those of us who teach, we don't just want to give people fish. We want to teach them how to fish so they can pass that down to others. You don't just give people Bible facts and Bible knowledge and just say, here it is, and just feed it to them. You want to help people search for it. You want to help people learn the critical thinking skills. You want to help people look themselves at the context. You want to help people come up with applications for themselves. Why do you think Brian and I in our Bible classes are always saying to you, how does this apply? What are some applications from this? Because we don't just want to feed it to you all the time. We want you to think for yourself, and you do a great job at that. Once you've learned how to do that, guess what you can now do? 
You can then go, go teach someone else how to fish. Instead of just giving them fish, evangelistically, you can teach others how to teach. And we actually do that really well in this congregation because of the wisdom of our shepherds. Two teacher arrangement in all the classes. You might not be a very good teacher, but you're teaching with somebody that is. And in that process, you're learning how to teach. And then you can pass that down to somebody else in the future. Third suggestion on how to carry out this mission of saving souls is by the power of multiplication. I want to ask you something. How, how long did it take the Great Commission to be carried out? Jesus told His apostles, go into all the world, preach the gospel to all creation. How long did that take? Anybody know? It, it took about 30 years. It took about 30 years. It took 29 years. Because it was A.D. 33, Jesus said... Go into all the world, preach the gospel to, to all creation. It was in about A.D. 62. When I say A.D., I'm saying not 18 or something like that, or A.D. I hope that the younger people understand. So he gave the command in year 33. In year 62, this is what Paul wrote. And he's talking here in the context about how God had taken these uh, Christians at Colossae and turned them from uh, their wickedness and uh, turn them back to the Lord to, that, that Christ might present them holy and blameless. Then he says this, If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, pay attention to this, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Year 62. The gospel... Paul says it was preached in all creation, the whole known world at that time. And that was without Facebook, without the Internet. That was without TV or radio or email or any of our modern technology. It was accomplished by face-to-face -face contact, feet on the ground. Technology can really help with evangelism. But we never need to underestimate the power of face-to-face -face contact, relationships, feet on the ground. So that was part of it, and the other part was, of course, multiplication. That's how it spread from, it was 11 apostles at the time when Jesus gave the command, to, to spread to the, to the whole known world, the gospel. And I will give you some fun facts here. Let's just say that in all the world, um, there's only one Christian. Just hypothetically, just imagine. Nobody else in all the world is a believer in the Lord, but one person is. And that he commits to convert one person. He's got the whole world out here, and he chooses one person to focus on. And at the end of 12 months, he has converted that one person, or God through, through that individual has converted that person. And now there are two Two individuals at the end of one year who are Christians on the entire planet, right? Now let's say that those two commit to convert one person each in one year's time. So that by the end of the second year, there are four Christians, and those four do the same thing. So the end of the next year, there are eight. Well, if that continued, then by the end of the seventh year, there would be 128 Christians on earth. That's not a whole lot. By the end of the tenth year, there would be 1,024 by the end of the 20th year, there'd be 1,048,576 Christians on earth. By the end of the 27th year, there'd be over 134 million. By the end of the 29th year, there'd be just over 1 billion. Sometime in the 32nd year, every human on earth would be a Christian. Now that, of course, is never going to happen. But it shows you the power of multiplication. It's not a few people doing a whole lot. It's just each one finding one. And so here's a takeaway from that, if we're still working up there. I don't know if it is. Yeah, there it is. Each one reach one. See, it doesn't have to be so overwhelming. Think of somebody you know that you have a relationship with, that trusts you, that, that maybe you feel like would be receptive to the gospel and make an effort to reach out to them and focus on that one person 
And if we just all did that, the kingdom, the kingdom would grow. Each one reach one. We all have a role in saving lost souls. I want to ask you here, in conclusion, how are you doing at this evangelism thing? How are you doing at letting God use you in your role, in your talent, in your skill set right now? Are you letting Him use you? Or are you burying that talent under the ground? Because if you are, then although we did not receive the command that God gave to Ezekiel to just warn everybody, I do believe we will bear some judgment for the fact that we let our talent just lie dormant. Because the Lord said, to whom more is given, more is required. And the Lord has given all of us an awful lot to pass on to others. And so let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Our Lord and God, we praise you. We thank you so much for your word. We pray that you will convict our souls, that, Lord, that you will strengthen us and help us to be more active in evangelism, whether we are actually teaching or whether we are facilitating the teaching of the, of the lost. And help us, Father, not to be lazy and not to be overwhelmed and not to beat ourselves up with unnecessary guilt either. Help us to be used by you in the current situation in our life with the opportunities and the talent you've given us. Give us courage and give us strength. And Father, we pray that as we plant and as we water, that, Father, you will cause the growth of the kingdom. And it's through your Son that we pray. Amen. Well, I mentioned uh, a few times the Great Commission. And Jesus said in Mark 16, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who disbelieves shall be condemned. He said in Luke 24, that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in His name to all the nations. And He told His apostles in Matthew 28, All authority has been given to Me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Have you obeyed those conditions? that Jesus told His apostles to go out to the whole world and teach and do? If you have not, you have opportunity today to become a Christian. If you need our prayers at this time, we also invite you to come and let your needs be known. And we would be happy to pray for you now as we stand and sing the song of invitation.